welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Take it down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful we get to come into your house, God. We get to sing your praises, lift our hands and our voices to you, God. What a blessing and what a joy it is. Father, we just pray that today as we open up your word, you open it up to us. Open us up to receive it. God, we pray that you open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we didn't come today to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, the... Any other color on the earth that we could imagine, Lord, we come to hear from the Holy Spirit who is the teacher of the church. So Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision and the wisdom and the direction of God. Give us even the instruction and the correction that we need for our our lives, Lord. And we thank you for that. God, don't just bless us. God, we ask that you bless all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, there are brothers and sisters. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, God. We pray that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley, God, for the well and the way, God. We thank you for Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist, God. Lord, all the churches that are preaching the gospel, God, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, for the four-square denomination, God, and for the assemblies. Lord, bless those that are preaching the gospel this day as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say amen. 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 You can have a seat. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me. We're going to go to two sections of Scripture today. That's all. Just two sections of Scripture. We're going to be taking a look at the birth of Jesus And we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. If you want to find Luke chapter 1, stick your finger in Luke chapter 1 or maybe a pencil or a ribbon or something like that. And then find Matthew chapter 1. We'll start out in Matthew chapter 1 and we'll be kind of bouncing back and forth a little bit today. Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1. While you're turning there, I want to read you a a poem that was written by someone you know. Name's Tony Cook. Remember Tony Cook? Just a great man of God, a great teacher of the Word of God. Him and another uh, great man of God by the name of David Beebe wrote this. And it's called, Twas the Fight Before Christmas, okay? Twas the fight before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was peaceful, not even my spouse. The bills were strung out on our table with dread in hopes that our checkbook would not be in the red. The children were fussing and throwing a fit when Billy came screaming and cried, I've been bit! Mama with her skillet and I with the remote She said, you change one more channel and I'll grab your throat. (laughs) When on the TV there arose such a clatter, I sat up on the couch to see what was the matter. When what to my wondering eyes should appear, the cable was out. It was my worst fear. (laughs) The Cowboys, the Celtics, the Raiders, the Knicks. Without the sports channel, I'd soon need a fix. (laughs) Then in the midst of my grievous sorrow, I remembered the times I had promised tomorrow. Not now, my children, but at some some soon time. Dad will play with you and things will be fine. Now under conviction, I looked at my wife. Where was my kindness? Why all the strife? My heart quickly softened. I now saw my task. Some love and attention was all they had asked. I gathered my family and called them by name. I told them with God's help, I'd not be the same. We'll keep Christ in Christmas and honor his plan. No more fights before Christmas. On that we'll stand. My children's eyes twinkled. They squealed with delight. My wife gladly nodded. She knew I was right. (laughs) It was the fight before Christmas, but God's love had come through. And just like he does, he made all things new. Isn't that good? With those thoughts in mind, today I want to talk to you about being led this Christmas. Being led this Christmas. It's amazing to me how many references there are in the Christmas accounts of the leading of God. You you look at it, it's it's actually so so prevalent in the scriptures that you almost kind of go, wow, how did I miss this? But God is leading people all throughout the Bible, all throughout the word of God, and today God wants to lead us in our lives individually. In fact, if you take a look at it, there's dreams. Joseph himself, uh, the father in, in, in the family of Jesus there, 
really the, the earthly father took that position. And we know that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. But Joseph being the father and the family there, he had four dreams that well, the angels appeared to him. And he had the leading of God in dreams. Also, we see angelic visits, right? You, you have Zacharias there in the temple during the hour of prayer, burning incense before the altar. And what happens? Here comes the angel speaking to him. Here's Mary speaking to the angel Gabriel. Here, here's Joseph in dreams seeing angelic visits. There's prophecies that take place. My goodness, so many prophecies. Multiple times people, the spirit comes upon them and something happens. They're led to prophesy, led to speak the word of God. Supernatural circumstances and occurrences. Think about how amazing it is that God moved a king, Caesar Augustus, to move a nation, the whole nation of Israel, to go and be a part of the census. And then that moved Joseph and Mary from where they were down to the city of David, down to Bethlehem, in order to have the Messiah born at that time in that place. God had to move the entire world in order to do what God said he would do through the scriptures, through the prophetic utterance that had been spoken before. My goodness. Signs and wonders in the heavens. Star appears, moves around in the night, leading people. Miracles taking place. The miraculous happened. We find that a virgin gives birth to a baby, and that's a sign to shepherds and a wonder amongst them. All surrounding the birth of Jesus. Now, we often write this off because this is Jesus being born. Of course there's going to be, you know, angels and dreams and supernatural stuff going on. I mean, this is Jesus coming into the earth. But do you think that God contained all of this in Scripture just so that we could learn what happened at his birth? Or do you think God is speaking something to us? Because all of these people that were there in the nativity story surrounding the birth of Jesus, they were all people like you and like me. And if they can be led by the Spirit of God to do what they did at that time, in that place, God is speaking to us that He wants to lead us today, lead us this Christmas season, and lead us every day of our life. Are you listening today? So today I want to talk to you about how to be led. See, it's one thing to see how they were led and see the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that took place. Quite another thing when we take a look at our lives and say, are we following the lead of God? How do I be led of the Spirit of God? How do I be led this Christmas season to make sure that I don't miss out on what God has for me? How to be led. First thing for today, first thing for today, how to be led is keep your heart right before God. Keep your heart right before God. See, because if your heart's not right, you are no longer in position to receive the leading of God. It's from a position of right standing before God, where your heart is right before God, you're believing God, that now you are in position to receive the lead of the Lord. But if your heart's not right, God's going to take care of your heart first before he leads you. If you are in sin... The Bible says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have heard my prayer. See, we, we've got to make sure to deal with the issues in our life because God looks at our issues. God looks, and if we're out of sync with God, God will make sure that we get in sync so that we can have the leading of the Lord. God's going to deal with those issues, going to deal with that sin, going to deal with that, uh, that heart issue first because God cares about our lives and it's all about the heart. Otherwise, we would stay out of sync with God and think that we were okay and walk through life following the leading of the Lord but thinking that that stuff in our life is okay. But God says, I want you to have a right heart before me. I want you to have a heart that is a believing heart, not a wicked heart of unbelief, not a heart that's out of sync, not a rebellious heart. I, I need your heart to be in the right place. So we look at the people that were used of God and led by God throughout this. I want you to take a look at the character of these people. Look at the heart of these people. Look at how they responded to the things of God. Matthew chapter 1. You're there in Matthew chapter number 1. We're going to take a look at verse number 18. At verse number 19. Let's take a look at this man, Joseph. Joseph, in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse number 18, reading through verse number 19. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18 says this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, stop right there. Okay, let me explain some things to you. Mary and Joseph were betrothed, okay? There was three stages in a, in a marriage in Israel at this time and in their culture, okay? First stage was that the families would come together and they would arrange the marriage. They would talk about terms. They would make sure that the people, were, the, the son and the daughter were going to come together and they would agree on that. They would agree on the dowry and the times and all that kind of stuff. And then they would, that was the first stage, okay? Then they were betrothed, which means that now there was like an engagement period that was taking place. It was a year-long period of time that they were now betrothed. We would, we would call it like the engagement period, but really... 
in, in the eyes of society and legally, these two were considered at that point married. Okay, It was as if they were husband and wife already. The final stage was the final ceremony or the, the covenant ceremony that they would have the wedding that would take place where they would consummate the marriage. So it says that they were betrothed and before they had come together. So this was before the covenant ceremony, before they consummated the marriage, Mary was found with child of the Holy Spirit. The problem with that is, is that Joseph had not yet had the angelic visit that told him that this child was of the Holy Spirit. So for Mary to be found with child, Joseph would have seen her with child and said, That's not mine. <laughs> Something's wrong here. Now, by legal right, Joseph could have grabbed her by her hair, drug her out into the middle of the city, called all of the elders of the city, and the whole place could have came out together. He could have spit in her face and handed her a certificate of divorce and said, you know what, you're with child, that's not my child, you're unrighteous, and I divorce you before this whole city right now, and he could have shamed her. And could have put a reproach and a scorn on her. In fact, could have had her stoned for committing adultery. She could have lost her life. But look at the character of this man, Joseph. Look at the very next verse. Verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband. Notice the words, her husband. See, it was as if they were already married. Joseph, her husband, even though they hadn't come together in the covenant. Even though they hadn't consummated the marriage. Joseph, her husband, being a just man. What does that mean? His heart was in the right place before God. Being a just man, how many of you know the Holy Spirit is the one that inspired this writing? So when God says somebody's just, they're not just just, they are just before God. God looks at them and looks at their life, and this is not an exaggeration. This is not just a generality. This is not a, a, a term that was just thrown around. No, God looked at Joseph's life and said, Joseph is just. Why did he say that? Look at the rest of the verse. Joseph being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. Now, the story goes on. While Joseph was thinking about these things, he fell asleep. He had a dream, and an angel visited him and said, Hey, listen, don't be afraid to take to her your wife. For what is conceived in her is born of the Holy Spirit, and you shall call his name Jesus. See, but Joseph had his heart in the right place. He was just before God, and because of that position he had with God, he was able to be led. Are you listening today? See, if we keep our hearts right before God... If we keep away from things like bitterness, you know, you, you could really be bitter towards family members or friends that have hurt you in the past. You could really be bitter towards others and say, you know what, they've hurt me, they've wronged me, and I don't like them, I don't want to be with them, I'm going to avoid them at the Christmas family dinner, you know, I'm going to sit on the opposite end of the table, that sort of thing. And you could miss out on the leading of the Lord. Why? Because your heart's not right. You're operating in bitterness and unforgiveness. And God says, I'm not going to work with that. I'm not going to lead you to do something if your heart's not in the right spot. And so we've got to get our hearts right before God so that we can follow the leading of the Lord. How about some other people in the Christmas story? Well, you, you get your finger there in Matthew chapter 1. Stick your finger, your pencil, ribbon, whatever, there in Matthew chapter number 1. And, and turn me to Luke, the first chapter this time. Luke, the first chapter. Talking about some more people that's hearts were right with God. Therefore, they were able to be led of the Spirit of God. Luke chapter number 1, we find a couple by the name of Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias and Elizabeth were the parents of John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist, you know the voice crying in the wilderness, the one who came in the spirit of Elijah, the one who baptized Jesus, that's his parents, his mommy and his daddy. All right. Now, they were old. They were well along in years. They hadn't had a child yet, but they were getting ready to be led by the Lord to bring John the Baptist, who would inaugurate and bring in the Christ. Okay, He was the one that would pave the way for Jesus to come, making straight the path of the Lord. And therefore, they had a leading that God was going to lead them on. But look at their hearts. Look at their hearts. Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, verse number 6. Luke chapter number 1, verse number 6, it says, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. In other words, not only could God see their hearts and their lives, and they were righteous before God in the right standing, their hearts were right before God, not only that, but also when other people looked at them, blameless. No one could say anything about them. There was no question about their lives. Well, you know, they, they do have that thing, you know, and, and, and I see them going over here every now and then, and that, or they're hanging out with that dude over there, and I don't like that dude. I know he's bad, so they're hanging out with him. No, they were blameless. See, not only did they have a reputation with God, they had a reputation with others. What about Mary? Mary, the mother of Jesus, the one who was privileged enough to carry the Christ inside of her and to deliver him into the world. Well, what sort of heart did Mary have? 
Luke chapter number 1, now verse number 45. Luke chapter 1, verse number 45, Mary's gone to see her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth is, 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 is pregnant now. Mary's going to be with a faith-filled friend, you know, and, and therefore she goes to visit her cousin. When she comes in, she greets Elizabeth. And when she greets Elizabeth, John the Baptist is still inside of Elizabeth's tummy. But from the time he was inside of her womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost was upon him. He leaps for joy on the inside of his mama. Boom, you know. And so there he is, and he, and he leaps for joy. And all of a sudden, Elizabeth, out of the overflow, the Spirit comes on her, and she starts to prophesy. She starts to speak forth the word of God. And look at what she says about Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse number 45. Blessed is she, speaking of Mary, who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Look at, look at the heart that Mary had. Blessed is she who believed. She didn't have an evil heart of unbelief. Her heart was in the right place. Her heart was right before God. She was in faith. See, she may have asked the question, I don't, I don't know how this is going to happen since I have not known a man. See, in her thinking, in the natural, you can only have a baby. When a man and a woman come together, then, then, then the, the baby, see, but, but without that, she's saying, I don't, know, I don't understand, because no man, then, then there's only the woman here, and, 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 and there's no, you know, so how's the baby going to come? And the, the, the angel had to tell her, well, no, 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 no it's not going to be like that. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and, and, and you will conceive and bear a child. Therefore, she says, what? Be it unto me as you have spoken. See, what did she do right then? She entered into faith. Her heart believed. She now received the promise of God, and therefore she conceived and bore the son. See, blessed is she who believed. How about one more? The guy uh, we talked a lot about last year during the Christmas season is named Simeon. You remember Simeon, right? For my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon was an older man. Simeon was a great man of God. Simeon was able to prophesy over the Christ child and over Mary's life. And Simeon was, was a, 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 just an awesome guy. Let's take a look at Simeon there in Luke chapter 2 this time. Luke chapter number 2. See, Simeon was led by the Spirit, and at the right time, in the right moment, he bumped into Mary and Joseph, and Jesus was able to scoop the child up in his arms and see the salvation of God before he died. Why was he able to be led? It was because his heart was in the right place. Luke chapter 2, verse number 25, says this. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. See, when your heart is right before God, you now put yourself in position to be led of the Lord. But if your heart's not right, God's going to deal with the heart first. You got issues, God's going to get his finger on the issues and say, deal with this. Deal with this. I want to be used. I want to be led, God. I want to do great things for you, God. Okay, let's deal with this issue. See, God's going to deal with the heart first. If you're in sin, time to get rid of the sin. Time to get rid of the stuff. If you're going in this direction in sin, it's time to repent, change your heart and your mind, and turn and go back God's way. And go away from the sin. Why? Because now your heart is in the right spot and you can be led by the Spirit of God. Are you listening today? Number one, how to be led. Keep your heart right before God. Second one, second one, this is a good one. Second one is listen and look. Listen and look. You're not listening, you're not going to hear the voice of the Lord. You're not looking, you're not going to see what it is God is doing. You're not going to see the lead of the Lord. Most of the people we read about in the accounts of Christ's birth... We're thinking, looking, doing. They were out there. They were, they were actively involved in pursuit. Think about Joseph, right? What was Joseph doing? He was thinking about what he was going to do. He was a just man. As far as in the right spot, thinking about what he's going to do. Now that Mary's with child, and what happens? He gets the leading of the Lord. Why? Because he was thinking about it. He was, he was active. He was involved. Okay? Simeon, we just talked about him, right? What was he doing? The Bible said that he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the consolation. He was looking. He was looking for the consolation. See, but if he wasn't looking, what would happen? There'd be no Simeon in the Bible, would there? There'd be no prophecy. There'd, there'd be no record of what he did. Why? Because he wouldn't have been looking and he wouldn't have found. See, the Bible says, ask, seek, and knock. Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. But if you don't ask, not going to happen. You don't seek, you don't what? Fine. You don't knock, no doors are open. See, you've got to be looking and listening. There's a great lady in the Bible. Love this. 
sees an older lady, her name's Anna, okay? Anna is, is, is at least like 84 years old, okay? Because the Bible says she was a virgin 84 years from her virginity. So that either means that she was 84 or 103 years old, okay? In any event, she's old, okay? And so Anna is like the church lady. You know the church lady I'm talking about. She's the one that's always hanging out. Every time the doors are open, she's there in church. Okay? And not only that, the, the way that Anna's described in the Bible, she's not only there, she's the one that's going out and come over here, dearie, right? And she's grabbing your hand and she just wants to hold your hand while she's talking to you and, and she grabs the cheek, you know, and she, she, she pats the face. That's her, she gives you a little kiss on the cheek when she hugs you, you know, that sort of a thing. And, you know, anybody else should be like, that's weird, don't hold my hand, I don't want you kissing me, I don't want you touching me. But because she's that old, Oh, you know, it's kind of like grandma, you know, so, so go ahead, you know, come on, hold my hand here. And, and you feel good about it after you leave, right? That's Anna, okay? Anna's there in the temple, and the Bible says that she is honoring God with prayers and fasting continually. Now, we would have looked at her and said, Grandma, eat, you know, come on, what are you doing, right? You, you don't need to be here in the temple, go home and rest. Okay? But she's seeking, she's active, she's doing something, she's going after it, she's listening, and she's looking, and she comes up right at the moment that Simeon finishes prophesying, and of course, Luke chapter 2, take a look at it with me, Luke chapter 2, verse number 38, Simeon's just done talking, now all of a sudden he introduces us to Anna, she comes, look at verse 38, Luke chapter 2, verse 38 says, and coming in that instant... See, she was led of the Lord right at the right time, right in the right place. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who... I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just had a little pause there because, you know, I wanted to make sure you guys were paying attention. Uh, hold on, let me read it again. Let me read it again. Here we go. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who... Looked for redemption in Jerusalem. That means if they weren't looking, she didn't talk to them. That means if they weren't looking, they missed out on a blessing. That means if they overlooked the old church lady. Ah, oh, she's crazy. She's here all the time. What's she doing? She just needs to go home. She needs to go lay down. She needs to go. See, if they weren't looking, they weren't finding. But what was she doing? She was speaking. She was giving thanks. She was praising God to all those who looked. For redemption. Are you looking for the leading of the Lord? Amen. Are you listening for his voice? Yes. Are you attentive to his call? See, your heart may be right, but you may not be looking. We've got to look. We've got to actively see. I love the wise men. Don't you love the wise men? Turn back with me to Matthew, the, the second chapter now. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. Talking about the wise men. Now, we don't know the wise men's name. We don't know how many of them there were. It's assumed there were three because of the three gives gold myrrh, frankincense, right? And so therefore, we, we assume there was three, but it could have been more, could have been less, right? And we don't know where they're from. Could have been from the east, you know, directly east of Israel. Could have been from, you know, a little bit further into Russia. Could have been all the way into China. You know, these guys could have come from a long distance away. Now, how did they know to go to Jerusalem? Let's take a look at it in Matthew, the second chapter, starting in verse number one. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1 starts out, it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Note that it says they were wise, okay? Because if you and I want to be wise, we need to take a look at what they were doing, because if we do the things that they did, then we're in the company of the wise, and he who hangs out with the wise shall be wise himself. So wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Verse number two, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have done what? Seen. We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. What does that mean? They were looking and they saw something and they came into Jerusalem. Now the whole of Jerusalem was troubled at this saying and the king and everybody started inquiring and started searching the scriptures. What does that tell us? That means that the king... That means that the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of that day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the lawyers and the scribes, and all of the religious people in Israel were not looking. 
they totally missed it. Why? Because they had blinders on of religion. I'm okay with God if I just do this. I'm going to make the sacrifice. Here's the morning sacrifice. Here's the daily sacrifice. Here's the evening sacrifice. Here's, I'm going to say my verses. Now I'm going to recite my prayers. I'm going to go and do my thing. And it was all a religious experience. And it wasn't about the heart. They were not looking. They could not look up from their religion to see what God was doing in the heavens. And therefore they missed the leading God, now the king says, go and worship him because I, I want to worship him myself. Come back and bring a report to me. Really, Herod was a murderous, wicked king, and he actually wanted to kill Jesus so that he could secure his throne. Well, look at what happens. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 9 and verse number 10. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 9 says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Till it came and stood over where the young Christ was. The star was actually leading them. They had to keep their eyes on the leading. They had to follow the leading. They had to see what God was doing. They had to stay attentive and stay and, and focus on what God was doing because now the leading was going before them and standing over the place. See, miracles, signs, and wonders, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, things are taking place. And now, what? Their heart's in the right spot. They want to worship the king and they're attentive. They're watching and therefore they were led to the place where Christ was. Verse number 10, when they saw the star. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They were watching. They were looking. This Christmas, as you go to the family dinner, you sit down with people you haven't been with for a year. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It matters what God is doing right now. And even though they may have hurt you in the past or been rude or mean or ugly, let's forgive that and let's move on because they need Jesus just as much as you did before you had Christ. Therefore, it's time to look and see, God, what do you want me to do? God, who do you want me to bless? God, uh, what can I say, Lord? What, what can I not say, God? You know? And God may whisper into your heart, I, I want you to just go and talk to your uncle. My uncle, I hate that guy. He's just rude and he's weird and he smells funny and I don't even know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? No, no, no. Look for the leading. Look for the leading. God, 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 what do you want me to do? God may say, just go sit by grandma. God may say, just go, just go give a hug to your sister. See, it may be that that hug just breaks the ice, melts the stony heart, and now all of a sudden opens the door for the gospel to be preached. You don't know, but if you're looking and if you're following, God will lead you. God's looking to do something. God's looking to move on the earth, which brings us to number three. Last one for today is follow the lead. Got to have a heart in the right spot. Got to be looking, got to be listening, got to be attentive. But finally, you got to follow the lead. Oftentimes I see that God will do one of two things. He'll either give you the end destination, and you don't know what's going to happen in between here and there. Or he won't give you the end destination, he'll just give you one little step. Now, we like it when he gives us the end destination. Why? Because we've got hope, we've got faith, we've got a future, we see what's going on. But what we don't realize is that there may be a Joseph journey that's ahead of us that leads to the pit and then leads to, you know, being a prisoner and a slave that goes to the prison and the dungeon, the deepest, darkest place and rejection. And then finally it reaches the palace and then the vision will come to pass that we saw originally where the family's bowing down, the sun, the moon, the stars, all that kind of stuff. And, and you're great. See, we, we like that, but we don't realize what's ahead of us. But most of the time I find in our life that God will not really give you the end destination. God gives you just one step. The Bible says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, right? And most of the time with God, God will illuminate what is the next step of life. God doesn't say, hey, I'm taking you here. Why? Because we would run over there. Oh, praise God, you know, and we'd miss out on all the stuff that God is leading us to. So God says, I'm not going to give you all the way down there. I'm going to give you this. See this? Step here. Okay. I'm here, God. And God says, okay, well, now no, no, step here. All right. Got it. Okay, what else, God? Well, 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 right here. And then here. And then here. And then here. And then eventually we get down here and we say, God, this is what you had for me? Wow. Look at what you did. Look at, look at all the stuff along the road. Look at, look at it. See, it's like Philip, right? Philip, all he had was, I want you to go down the road. And I want you to go over there. And so he goes over there and then he sees a chariot driving by. And this angel tells him, I want you to go up and overtake that chariot. So he goes up to buy the chariot. And he hears him reading out of Isaiah. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no, I don't understand what I'm reading. How can I understand? Unless somebody explains it to me. So he jumps in the chariot, starts to explain, preaches Jesus to him. He says, Jesus, he says, oh, hey, hey, 
hey, there's some water over here. Let's baptize you, brother. So he gets him in the water. Bam, baptizes him, right? And all of a sudden, zap, he's right out of the place, translated out of there, and shows up somewhere else. See, what did he have? He had one step. He had a little lead. And as he followed that lead, God gave him the next step. And God gave him the next step. And God gave him the next step. See, if you follow the lead, God will give you more lead. The next step and the next step and the next step. But if you don't follow the lead, you're going to end up like Zacharias. Right? There he is in the presence of the angel. Mary had asked, how is this going to be? Because it had never been done before. Zacharias, who knew the scriptures, would have known that Abraham and Sarah had had a child in their old age. So he asked the angel, how do I know what you're going to say is going to come true? And the angel says, I stand in the presence of God. I'm sorry. Excuse me. (laughs) Therefore, you're going to be quiet. You're not going to say another word because what's coming out of your mouth is foolish. And we don't need evil hearts of unbelief right now. So you're going to be silent until the appropriate time. And so all of a sudden he can't speak. Right? See, there's sometimes where people come to me and say, Pastor, I haven't heard the voice of God in a long time. I don't know what happened. I used to hear God's voice every day. It used to be just like water flowing in my life. And just, you know, every day was, was a leading of the Lord and God was doing great things. It seemed like all of a sudden it shut up and God's distant. I don't understand, Pastor, what's going on. Many times when I hear that statement, I'll say, well, what's the last thing God told you? What's the last thing you remember God telling you to do? And think about it for a while. Hmm. God told me to do something. Okay. Did you do it? Hmm. No, I didn't do it. Well, go back and do what God told you to do and then come back and tell me what happened. Right? A week later, they come back and they are rejoicing. They're jumping out of their skin. Pastor, the water has turned back on. It's flowing. God's speaking to me. I did what God said for me to do. And all of a sudden, bang, I heard the voice of the Lord. And now God's talking to me. And it's like it used to be. Why? Because they followed the lead. God is not going to lead people that are disobedient and rebellious. God leads people that will follow his lead. Are you listening today? The moment Zacharias wrote on the tablet, his name is John. What happened? His mouth was open and his tongue was loosed. And he's able to speak and prophesy and glorify God. Matthew chapter number one. Let's go back and look at this guy, Joseph, again. Last, last couple of verses, Matthew chapter one, verse 24 and 25. Remember, Joseph was thinking about what he's going to do. He has the dream. Angel tells him, don't be afraid to take to her your wife, okay? And you shall call his name Jesus, okay? So he had clear instructions, clear direction from the Lord of what to do. Look at what happens with Joseph. We're talking about following the lead. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. Did you see it? Did you catch it? Let me read it to you again because I'm going to shout the word. That's, that's really what I'm emphasizing, okay? Just so that we all know what we're talking about. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him, his wife. Did you see it? Did you get it? Okay, now let's look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now Joseph, as the man, as the head of the house, as the father in the house, the husband, had the responsibility for that home. And he also had the responsibility of naming the son, just like Zacharias named John, right? They wanted to name John Zacharias. He said, because you don't have a relative named John. You can't name him John. You can name him Zacharias after you, right? So they go and they motion to him. He said, bring me something to write. You know, give me something to write with. You know, he's doing this number. So they bring it to him. He writes, his name is John, right? He had the responsibility as the father to name the son. Therefore, here's Joseph. He's been given instructions by the angel. What if he would have named Jesus Joseph? See, he would have been opposed and rebellious, but he did as the angel commanded, and he called his name Jesus. See, he followed the lead of the Lord. You know what happens? Then later on, he's warned in a dream. Herod's going to kill the innocents. So he flees to Egypt. Then he's spoken to, once again, it's time to come back out. That fulfills the scriptures that I called my son out of Egypt. So he comes up and being warned in a dream, he's led again. Don't go back to Judea, go up to Nazareth. So he goes up to Nazareth, right? And several times we see that Joseph is led. Why? Because he continued to follow the lead of God. There's a tombstone in England of a cavalier soldier with the epitaph written on it. He served King Charles with a constant, dangerous, and expensive loyalty. 
He served King Charles with a constant, dangerous, and expensive loyalty. I would imagine if we could go and talk to that soldier before he died. And we, we said to him, you know what, your, your service to the king was constant, dangerous, and expensive. He would have said, no, it wasn't any of those things. It was just my duty. All I was doing was following the orders of the king. And it was my reasonable service. It was no sacrifice. It was just what was expected of me. Church, may it be said of us by those from outside that our service to our King Jesus in following him is constant, it's dangerous, and it's expensive. It will cost us our life as we take up our cross and follow him, looking for the leading of the Lord. Come on today, can you give the Lord a great big praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. You got good? God is so good to us. I, I want to ask everybody, please remain seated during this time. Nobody get up. No one leave during this time. I want to follow the leading of the Lord. I believe that God wants to do something in people's lives right now. So I'm going to ask everybody to stay put for a moment. We've got a couple of minutes left here. I want to just take some time to do something. If you're feeling sick in your physical body in this room, the Bible says that God will confirm his word with miracles, signs, wonders, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. God wants to do that to confirm the word to you. If you're not feeling well in your body, stand to your feet right now. Go ahead. Don't be afraid. You've got pain, any sort of sickness, that sort of a thing. Chronic issue, doesn't matter how long. It could have been your whole life you've been dealing with this thing. Stand up. Could have been just today. Stand up. God wants to confirm his word with miracles, signs, wonders, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? People are standing up all over the place. Now, if you want to stand in the gap for somebody, you're saying, I, I, I'm not sick, but you know, so-and-so has been on my heart. They're in the hospital. They're at home. Been laid up. They're sick. Go ahead and stand on their behalf right now. Look, there's almost the whole church is standing. Those of you that are seated, I want you to just do something for me for a second. If, if, you're, if you're one of the first group that stood up, you're, you're personally feeling sick or pain in this room, just lift a hand to the Lord right now. Those of you that are seated, let's, let's join our faith right now. Let's just believe God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for those that have their hands raised right now in our midst, God. Those that are sick here in the body of Christ, Lord. Why should there be sickness in the body of Christ, Lord? We are your people. You said there was none feeble among Israel. So right now, we speak to these bodies. Be healed in Jesus' name. God, we declare the word of the Lord into these sick and pain-filled bodies. Be free of sickness. Be free of pain in Jesus' name. And Father God, we declare that by your stripes, they were healed. And so we receive healing in Jesus' name. Those that are standing on behalf of someone else, God, right now we declare the word of the Lord that wherever they're at, all over the world or here in the Inland Empire, God, we declare your healing in their bodies. God, you sent forth your word and you healed them as it says in the Bible, God. And so we believe you at your word, God, and we pray for miracles, signs, and wonders to be poured out all over in Jesus' name. God, we thank you, Lord, that there will be testimonies today that wherever they're out in their homes, wherever they're out in the hospital, God, wherever that, right now, Lord, maybe they're sick at work, maybe they're sick somewhere else, God, but we pray, Lord, that you would touch their physical bodies right now in Jesus' name and heal them. We pray it in your name. Amen and amen. Now, now, before you sit down, before you sit down, okay, those of you that stood up first, okay, you're feeling sick in your body, how many of you already feel a change? Just raise a hand. Anybody already feel a change? Okay, now, keep... Put them up high, please. Put them up high. You already feel a change. Everybody look around. Look around. Look at the hands that are raised, okay? Get a little wave to us, okay? Because there's a lot of people in here today. Okay, look at, the, look at the hands that are already raised. Can we just praise the Lord? Can we just thank God for that? Look at that. God is confirming his word. His beautiful signs, wonders, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Isn't God good? Hey, I want to thank you guys for staying put. You guys have been great today. Um, I want to remind you about church tonight, 6 o'clock. And as well, invite you out for a water baptism after this church service or after the third service today. If you haven't yet done that, come on, let's do it. Let's follow the lead of the Lord. Jesus did it. We, we ought to do it. Follow his lead. I want to talk to you guys before you leave. Take a couple more minutes of your time, then I'm going to let you go. Okay? But just give me a couple more minutes of your attention. I want to talk to you about your eternal life. Because the Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. We need to take time and... Search our hearts. The Bible says that we should test ourselves. 
see whether or not we're in the faith. I want to put you to the test today. Here's the test. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you, God. What if today was your last day on the earth? Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that in your heart. No one will know the answer but you, God. Recently, uh, two celebrities died. One of them was 89 years old. One of them was 40 years old. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not given a certain number of days. God only knows the times and the seasons. And therefore, I want to make sure you know right now where you're at with God. Examine yourself. Where are you going to go? Heaven or hell? Sometimes people say, I don't believe in hell. Well, not that convenient? You know, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. It's a very real place. Just by denying its existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to deal with it. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven, Pastor. I'm going to get to go to heaven because I stay true to myself. And you, you stay true to yourself. You believe that's cool. You believe your thing. I believe my thing. And we'll all get there somehow, some way. But the problem with that statement, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. And not all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon here on the earth. It doesn't work like that. I love you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get there. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been good. I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds in my lifetime. Do you know that nowhere? Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible says you can get to heaven because you've been good, nice to your neighbors, haven't done more bad than you did good, or because you, you've helped out and gave money to charities or been involved in social justice causes and things like that, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible says you can be good enough because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to get to heaven based on your goodness. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I was raised in church. My parents told me they were Christians growing up. They hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized your Christian as a child? Took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhists, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, Right? wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible say your parents raised in church tell you you're Christian, makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, be born in America, that gets you into heaven. And because you're not some other religion, you think God's sitting up there in heaven going, oh, well, they're not anything else. I guess I'll lump it in the category of being a Christian. They get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Come on, today. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I got involved in my last church. I, I sang in the choir, helped out, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. You know, I attended all the time, and, and here I am sitting in this church today right now. And we got a membership card at that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Show that to me in the Bible, could you? You help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, you teach some Bible classes. It doesn't work like that. No one in the Bible say you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's like saying I can sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. No, a person sitting in my garage. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's sitting at the gates of heaven waiting, looking for your membership card before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, but I know God. I know about Jesus and celebrate Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Great, glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you, where you know who God is, celebrate a holiday, or can quote some scriptures, that gets you into heaven. In fact, if you read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is, can quote scriptures, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having a head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Today, God's after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. He wasn't talking about a natural birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. Our society's made a mockery out of that term. They made it out to be some weirdo thing, something that we don't want to be associated with. This is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic, gross words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then. 
God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence to hell. And you might say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'd be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be embarrassed. Let's get over that today. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than to stand up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Psh, come on. The devil's going to try and talk you out of it. Your flesh is going to be scared and say, people are looking. Yeah, we are. We're excited for you. No one's criticizing. No one's judging. No one's condemning. We've all done this at one point or another in our life in some way or another. Now it's your turn. We give God all of your heart. We give God all of your life. And even if you are embarrassed, better to be embarrassed than to end up in hell. So come on today. We give God all of your heart. We give God all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today. Make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe you. You can get a right relationship with God by simply raising your hand and acknowledging your need for Jesus in a moment. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world, wherever you're at, you can raise your hand. God is watching. God is looking. If you're here on campus telling us we're coming into the church service right afterwards. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. Where are you at? Who else? There's three. Got you right here. Uh, up on top, there's four, five. Thank you. God bless you. Six. Got you. Over here on this side. There's six wise people already. This side. Over here, seven. Thank you. Uh, anybody else real quick? Got you over there. Eight up top. Got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. If I saw your hand, you can put it down. Eight, nine up in the family room. Thank you. Got you over there. Who else today? Ten up on top. Up there. Thank you. Eleven, twelve. Got you guys up there. Thirteen, fourteen right there. Thank you. Thank you. Got you. Thank you right there. Who else today? Fourteen wise people. You're number fifteen, number sixteen. You, sh you should do this. Let's go for it. Be led this Christmas. Thank you. Got you right over here. Fifteen wise people already. Who else today? Anybody else? We'll close it up. Don't miss this opportunity. If that's you, you need to get right with God. Just simply raise your hand right now. If that's you, anybody else? Up there, thank you. Got you up there. 16. Anybody else? Let me do one last pass. This is your time. Go for it. This is your time. Go for it. Who else today? Who else today? Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Anybody else? Real quick. I don't see them. Where are they at? Up there? Got you up there. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. All right. About 16, 17 wise people. All right. Can we give the Lord a great big praise? Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Here's what I want you to do. All 16, 17, if I counted you, maybe I missed you. That's okay. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, no one leave during this time. Very hard to get people to come forward when you're going that way. They'll follow you that way. Okay? We want to get them going this way. All right? Because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So that's you. You raised your hand. You should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Get your stuff. Get a friend of you. Need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. My hand as they come. Hallelujah. From the family rooms, come on, bring your children. They'll remember this. Come on, if you were in the foyer, you come on down right now. I'm up on top, wherever you're at. Come on down, come on down, come on down. All right, all right. 
Hey, if you still need to come, just get your stuff. Come on down right now. It's not too late. If you, even if you didn't raise your hand, you come on. All right? Yeah. Hey, praise God, you guys. Glad that you guys came. This is awesome. You can put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. Okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Look at this guy over here waving at you in the nice light coat. That's Pastor Joel. Okay? Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? This is about as weird as you're going to encounter today, okay? He's cool. All right? He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. I'm wondering what's going to go on, okay? I'm going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Give you some free stuff, free information, free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it, okay? And then I'll let you come right back out, all right? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.